if you want to go after like a direct customer or, or you can do this with your broker as well, uh, just ask them, ask them what their, what their toughest load to cover is. Ask mm. them what no, nobody in their right mind ever wants to do for them. Right. And you know, there's a chance that you can, yeah. and if you can, you're going to have that guy for life. Hey, everybody. Here's the toast of the year that was and still is for a few more days, anyway. Counting down through 14 of the most listened to podcasts of the year, and what you heard up top was one of my own contributions to one of them. Our Partners in Business program, Roundtable, moderated by Red Eye Radio's Eric Harley at the Mid America Trucking Show. That little anecdote, it's a little piece of advice acted upon years ago during some of the early parts of past Overdrive Trucker of the Year, Henry Albert's career as an independent owner operator, slotted into a discussion of building value for direct customers, brokers and carriers too for that matter, in a year that has been most certainly a struggle on that front for many. I'm Todd Dills, your host for this final 2023 podcast edition as usual, and I'll say this has been a year that will probably go down as one most can be proud simply have survived with some profit show for it. As my colleague Alex Lockie suggested in his own year in review look at some of the biggest stories of the year. Before we start today's drive through the top 10 most listened to episodes of the year though, a four hour delay at the Shippers Dock with some honorable mentions just outside the top 10. The first provides something of an example of how one owner operator set himself up to weather the storm of declining rates in 2023 with years, even decades, of preparation with cost control with bedrock frugality in business and life, and a rig well-maintained, long paid off. Jay Hosty, now among our Trucker of the Year finalists, could well afford to be choosy about freight. Even if $2 a mile certainly hurt after getting used to 4 plus in the boom times of a couple years ago in his Landstar leased operation. Hosty's education in owner-operator business builds on 40 years of hard-won, self-taught, in many cases, lessons, as he told Overdrive News Editor Matt Cole earlier in the year for this profile. One of the biggest things I say is, I was born with the gift of being frugal. <laughs> and, and, and that means that I like saving money. And I just right. liked that as a, ki- as a kid. You know, I, I bought... My first motorcycle, because my parents said, if you can save the money, we'll let you get a, a motorcycle, a dirt bike. And, and I saved. I worked and I saved. I've never had a problem saving money. And I'm, so I'm kind of still like that. Well, definitely still like that. And um, when I was about, I want to say I was about 17, I, I come across an a, a owner-operator magazine before over. Well, I don't know if it's before Overdrive, but... I don't know if you remember that it was a Chil- Chilton Publishing, and it was Owner Operator Magazine. And so Overdrive was it founded in 1961, so it was in fact around at the time. If my memory is correct, Randall Riley, Overdrive's parent company, became the publisher of Owner Operator in later years. In fact, I came across one of those, and I was interested, of course, in trucking and being an owner operator. And they had an article in there about cost per mile. And this magazine, I think it was 1979. Mm-hmm. And I read the article and was just intrigued about how you break everything down by the mile, all your cost. And that stuck with me th- through my career. You know, I'm real big on per mile. I don't, you know, some guys will ask, well, what's a load pay? Well, that really don't tell me anything. I got to know what's it pay per mile that's what tells me what it is if it's good or not you know but yeah that that between that and just being frugal it's really i think helped help me succeed in business next and what might be my all-time favorite opening for any edition of overdrive radio not just in 2023 a little whipped cream of reality on top of the may week that this year was the road check inspection blitz with longtime independent mustang mike crawford you know my number but anyhow I'm just gonna call you and uh, uh, keep 
keep uh, track or tabs or count or whatever of the scales that I've crossed that have been closed. Nobody there, nobody home, not inspecting, not doing nothing. I crossed the Missouri scale, eastbound 44 in St. Clair this morning. They were closed, locked up. I just crossed uh, the scales on eastbound 70 in uh, Brown, I think Brownstown or Brownsville, Illinois, at about the uh, 72 yard stick. They were closed, locked up, nobody home. Crawford then loaded near Chicago Wednesday morning and made his way south down 65 all the way into Kentucky with nary a hint of an inspection or a scale house open on his route too. By morning Thursday, he was staring down the possibility of inspection by Bluegrass State personnel at Elizabethtown. The run continuing south, but... Rider, it is Mustang again. I am the luckiest sum gun in the world. It is a... Uh, 11.09 my time and I just went past the southbound Kentucky scales at uh, Elizabethtown, Kentucky and they were closed, locked up nobody home, nobody around so anyhow When he got down close to the Tennessee reason. line the northbound scale in Franklin turned out and uh, they are open there was one truck in there that was it he didn't have to cross it so far, all the southbounds have been closed. A couple of northbounds have been open. Talk to you later. Just a few minutes you, later, bye. then, crossing into Tennessee. Tennessee, mile marker 121, or one, yeah, 121. The scales there, on the southbound side, are closed. Uh, doing road construction, they are, the scales are being used for construction <laughs> storage. Anyhow, so far, I haven't seen a southbound scale open. Picked up the next call as Mustang took Tennessee 155 Briley Parkway around the north and east sides of Nashville to connect to I-24 east toward Chattanooga to I-75. Mustang let me know he was waving at me from about three miles as the crow flies down around the Opryland Hotel area. Then, at Manchester, Tennessee on I-24. Just went past the southbound chicken house. I-24, I mean eastbound chicken house, I-24. And uh, it is just parking area now. It's uh, all, the building's all blocked off and everything. Uh, the westbound was open and way of people. Trees were there. I could not see if they were doing any inspection. But that makes, uh, so far, I haven't found an open scale. Been my good luck, but I know what'll Continuing happen. on then, coming into Georgia at Ringgold on I-75. Mile marker 343, I-75 southbound. Nobody home. They were locked up. Nobody there. Looked over to the left side, northbound side. I didn't see anybody there either. Ghost Rider, here we go with another report. Mile marker 191, southbound Interstate 75. Forsyth, Georgia. Southbound chicken house locked up. Been my lucky day. So we'll see. I got one more here in Georgia. Then I get to play with Florida. So anyhow. A third hour of on-duty holdup, as it were. One regular podcast listener's got a taste of mid-December. Overdrive readers then earlier this week. Also among our most listened to episodes of the year, touring the great trucker songwriter Tony Justice's Greatest Shifts record, that episode started with a veritable bang, of course, with the dance remix of Justice's Last of the Cowboys modern classic. Jesse James, modern day outlaw game. If 
Finally, in the early summer, we picked up on themes of building business, building life along the way, the podcast edition of our owner-operator work-life balance webcast with 2021 small fleet champ Jason Cowan, owner of Silver Creek Transportation, and Adam Wingfield of the Innovative Logistics Group, who told his own personal story of learning the OTR work-life balance mismatch and building an operation to improve the situation long-term. When we think about trucking, trucking as an industry and we think about the truck driver itself, I remember when I first began as a independent driver, I remember uh, my actual coach at that time, who was my driver trainer, I looked at him as my coach, who was my driver trainer, told me, he said, hey, Adam, I want you to think about this. Home time is one of the things that's gonna be elusive to you. So you've gotta be prepared to spend more time on the road than you do at home. And then he subsequently said, well, to be more honest with you, you're gonna visit home and you're gonna live on the road. And that kind of hit me kind of hard because I was a young kid coming out of coming out of high school, really didn't understand what, what being away from home would look like until I got out there. When I first started, I started with, as a company driver. I was working for a mega carrier, and at the time I was making 23 and a half cents a mile. When we think about driver pay and we think about all that good stuff, back then uh, when I started, we had the eight hour breaks versus 10. There was a lot of things that were a lot, lot different. But that initial experience uh, as a company driver really opened my eyes up to a lot of things when it came to having control of my own time and having control of my, my work-life balance. I moved on, I progressed quickly as, into lease ownership at the age of 23. And the reason why I wanted to do that is because I wanted to have a little bit more control over that work-life balance. What I found was almost the opposite because at that time when I shifted into that of an owner operator, I didn't have that fail safe to fall back on that a company driver would. Every single response, bit of responsibility was my own. In order to make sure that I was able to keep the truck note going and able to keep the wheels turning and being able to keep the lights on at home, I had to make sure I kept that truck running. So it's very, very challenging for me. The balance that I sought as, a, as an independent was really one of those things, almost like a mirage or a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. The trucking industry as a whole, and when it comes to deregulation back in the 1980s and what that did to the trucking industry, it really didn't even provide us with a, an oversight of what to truly expect as a truck driver. Now, I love trucking. Trucking was always in my blood. I always loved the smell of diesel fuel. You know, there's nothing like coming out of a uh, coming out of your bunk and waking up, stepping out of the truck and smelling the good old smell of diesel at a TA truck stop or something like that in the, in, on, a, on a Tuesday morning. But realistically, when, when you come back and look to it, one of the main reasons why I got into the trucking industry was number one was my love for for trucks, but number two, most importantly, was a personal story. It helped me get out of depression. Uh, when I got into behind the wheel of a truck, you know, it's just you and the road. You know, it's just you, the road, and 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 some of the things that come with it that are not so good, and some of the things that come with it were good. So then I really, really decided that as I progressed through as an independent. I realized that when I was leased onto a carrier, I realized at that point that maybe I could change and I can challenge that, that ideology by getting my own authority as I continue to chase that independency. Being an owner operator and being leased to another company, I found out very quickly, I still have some of those same ties as responsibility ties into a company driver. I just had the responsibility of owning a truck. So I guess I said, hey, you know what, let's self, let's go ahead and chase a different, different level of independency. And I went out and got my own authority at that time. And how did he make good on increasing levels of independence with authority? By building work-life balance with a mix of direct customers on both ends of preferred freight lanes out of his home area in South Carolina at the time. Wingfield's story is an inspiring one, clearly. And that webcast followed his telling of it in greater detail in a session at the Mid-America Trucking Show earlier in the year. He was joined in our webcast by, as I said before, Silver Creek Transportation small fleet owner and past overdrive small fleet champ, Jason Callen, who spoke to similar concerns along the growth path for owners who eventually expand beyond just the single truck. It's worth another listen as you look out ahead at 2024, particularly if your goals for growth beyond one truck are similar to those achieved by both Wingfield, eventually, and Callen. On the other side of a break, We'll get the green light to load and start the drive toward a countdown from number 10. And note that there's a playlist that features those 10 as well as the four honorable mentions just outside the top 10 for 2023. Find it on Overdrive Radio's SoundCloud profile via a link in the show notes, wherever you're listening, 
or in the post that houses this podcast for December 29th at the world famous overdriveonline.com slash overdrive hyphen radio. Now, we'll pause for a word from Overdrive Radio's sponsor. Here's a big thanks to the house company for their continued support. It's most certainly that time of year where the anti-gel fuel treatments for which they're famous come into play. So stay warm out there. Winter weather predictions can be unreliable. Be prepared for whatever is in store this year with Howe's Diesel Treat and Howe's Diesel Lifeline. The nation's number one anti-gel, Diesel Treat is the only guaranteed anti-gel on the market. And Diesel Lifeline has absolutely no harmful alcohol and requires no mixing or fuel filter replacements. Available nationwide, Howe's products are designed to keep you rolling through the toughest conditions. Howe's, tested, trusted, guaranteed. Visit HowesProducts.com. That's H-O-W-E-S, houseproducts.com. Again, big thanks to House for all their support. Now, number 10 in the most listened to podcast countdown here as we set off on the drive 2024 involved what was among the biggest stories of the year for independents working spot markets for freight. The explosion of organized double brokering rings and all the mess they made of the federal authority registration system activity there exploded during the spot market boom of 2020 and 2021. The podcast featured parts of a talk delivered at Matt's in March by one Jason Decker. A rallying cry it was for a whole-of-trucking approach to the fight against double brokering, leaching money from the freight markets through fraud, as it is. Rates are bad enough already, it's sure, as Decker emphasized. Fraudulent actors insert themselves into a freight transaction, disappear with a fuel advance, or the entire load's payment, even. If the truckers paid at all, then it's a double payment on the part of whoever was the original broker and or shipper on the load. That's but one double brokering scenario, though. Perhaps worse than that, in Decker's, and I know many owner-operators view, legit brokers who knowingly give the load to another brokerage, as Decker said. Quote, They are double dipping. Rates are tight enough as it is, that one hand in the pot is a one too many. End quote. Two. Three. Market distortion is all the worse for it, with the trucker on the short end of the stick. Deckers with Arkansas-based brokers General Transportation and Carrier ART Trucking. Three years from the podcast, detailing the most damaging, perhaps, of the double brokering scams. The hit-it-and-move-on type, where the scammer has no attention to ever pay the carrier who actually moves the load. Hey, I've got this load. It goes from, let's say, Fort Smith, Arkansas to Richmond, Virginia. Now, let's say that lane should normally pay $4,000. They're going to tell you, oh, we're going to pay you $5,500 on that load. The reason they can quote you whatever is because they're never going to pay you to begin with. It doesn't matter to them. All they care about is getting someone to actually haul that load. Once they get it on the, your truck and you move that load, then what they're going to do is, is they're going to call that broker and say, hey, uh, we've got it loaded there and everything. Can, can I go ahead and get a fuel advance? That's a very common thing because even if that broker finds out later down the road before it's even delivered that the load was double broker, they at least have the fuel advance money. Next thing that's going to happen is, is when you deliver that load, they're going to say, hey, we need those bill of ladings ASAP to bill our customer. We need it right now, right now, right now. You send in the bill of ladings because you're trying to make sure you're doing what you need to do so that you're not getting fined, you're not losing out on anything. They send it to the actual broker. Broker says, okay, got it, appreciate it. And then the, the scammer says, hey, we need quick pay. Okay, that's fine. Let's go, we'll, we'll, we'll do quick pay for 3%. Once again, the scammers could care less about that 3% because it's about to be 100% profit for them. What they're going to do at that point is they get that quick pay, less than 3%, and then they've got money in the account. But they don't do this once a day or twice a week or whatever. They'll do this 10, 15, 20 times a day. One scammer can rack up hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars in false loads weekly. It happens time and time again. Now, that broker, will they'll wind up ghosting you usually. They, they're not going to answer your calls. Um, and then by the time you figure out what's going on, they're gone. They're, everything's canceled out, phone numbers, everything. You're not getting a hold of them. Search double brokering at overdriveonline.com for more on how carriers can recognize and combat these kinds of schemes. There was quite a lot of reporting around the subject in 2023, 
and past years for that matter too. Now, on to number nine, another in our series of Trucker of the Month profile podcasts toward our Trucker of the Year Award for 2023. This one in particular featured one truck independent car hauler, Crystal Rives, hauling out of Cleveland, Texas, and making a solid living in a pristine 2006 379 and open car haul trailer running intrastate loads. Once you drive a truck and it's in your blood, it just can't wash it out. <laughs> yes, I started my business in uh, 2016 or 17, but I hauled cars for other people, and it's just being a woman in the industry, it's like I was the only girl, and they didn't want to hire me because I was a girl and said it was too hard, I couldn't do it. And I'm like, you're talking to somebody that grew up in a truck, so say it's too hard and I can't do it, you know. Like my grandpa always said, just show them you can do it and do it better than them. So that was been my kind of motto, saying that I've lived by. If somebody ever tells you you can't, just show them you can. And, Show them you can do better than them. <laughs> so, sure. It was always was, one of those things. What was your grandfather's name? Uh, it was uh, Paul Peacock Sr. He started a gravel business back whenever he uh, was younger. They owned a farm, so farming and trucking and kind of goes hand in hand. My grandpa, he passed away in 2003 and left okay. the business to my dad and my dad is in his like 60s now so he's retired he's got a hernia bad back from driving so but he you know he don't drive trucks anymore you know my grandpa passed away and my dad he can't do it no more i remember bouncing around the back of the truck with a little tiny black and white tv and my dad's 1983 359 with a 400a model it had that 15 speed, a little bitty sleeper back there, and he'd be like, watch, watch something, and we'd have like this little bitty five inch black and white TV back there plugged in, but it, you know, and we'd stop at the cafe and get some chicken or something, Right. but old school trucking, that's, <laughs> yeah, yeah, just kind of yeah. one of those things, you know, you just, don't see a lot of people that were taught by the old school generation like my grandpa and my that drove no trucks with air rod or uh you know or don't you know or they don't people don't even know what a five and four transmission is they look at you like you're crazy but we have two dump trucks too we have a 73 kenworth with a five and four has a nice big old 400 big cam cummins in it we have a 94 peterbilt dump truck that's just like my side hustle you know but car hauling is definitely where i've made all my money number eight in the countdown the sounds and insights of oil services hauler edward jackson top operator for 2022 small fleet champ john mcgee trucking I got the opportunity early in the year to see McGee's production water hauling operation firsthand. Edward Jackson provided a great guide through the northern Louisiana lease roads and well sites. Here he is getting to, eventually, the story of how harrowing it can be sometimes getting to and from particularly remote well sites. Not really, though. We got one man called uh, the Hayes Tim One. Uh-huh. And it's like, I know at least five to seven miles back in the woods. Oh, okay. You're the only one back up. It takes a long time it to get there. Long time, yeah. yeah. I told Mr. John, I said, uh, before I go back there again, because it was a lot of rain, and I said, before I go back there again, they need to replace the road. Because uh, when I went in there, uh, I was kind of skeptical about getting back out. Yeah. So I'm in that load, and here come a, uh, a worker over rig truck. Ah. He don't make it even walk because you know his truck is even heavy. Yeah. When I came back out, I got out that first part. <laughs> that second part, I was like, man, I said, I ain't going to panic. So I had to drop the airbag down. Yeah. Put all the weight up there on the front. Sure. And when I mashed it, I said, I'm going to get off. She just 
climbed out slowly for shoulder, and I was like, I ain't come back. Wow. I like that. Yeah. So back up a little bit on that. So the gun, so you, you're going down a one lane road and you got a, another truck coming right at you. No. No. I'm on location. Oh, okay. It's a one lane road. Okay. But I'm on location getting loaded. Yeah. See, I'm, I'm thinking if nobody else come back in here, you know what I'm saying? I'll be all right. Yeah. Cause but I'm here coming he back out. Yeah, here now you, you got no space He don't made <laughs> different tracks and everything. Yeah. He don't like the guy stuck, slip yeah. and slide. So I got to go back out, point in the hit rut. Yeah. <laughs> I made out of one spot, but I came to the other spot. I'm like, man. Yeah. All the thing I can think about is I don't been in this predicament before. Yeah, right, right. So I'm way back here. I ain't got no service in that. Yeah. So I don't know if he got out. Number seven in the countdown then, shifting gears and powertrains, as it were, to the American Transportation Research Institute's work around throwing a little reality into the national push to electrify freight transportation with battery and other electric drive trucks. Overdrive News Editor Matt Cole's conversation with Atri's Dan Murray early in the year turned heads and bended ears with a focus on a variety of aspects of that critical report. None more so than the parking disaster easily imaginable with a wholesale turn to trucks that can take several hours worth of parked charging to refuel. Uh, a third challenge lies with long haul truck charging. As you know, there's already a huge problem in the U.S. with, with the truck parking shortage. It is perennially identified by drivers as a top concern through our annual top industry issues survey. So finding a truck parking space is often difficult. Finding finding a truck parking space with a charger is going to be an entirely different ballgame. How do the hours of service and, and the truck parking issues specifically uh, relate to the charging they issues? Are completely, they are completely intertwined. Um, when you find yourself behind the wheel of an electric truck, you realize it's now essential to find a truck parking space that has access to charging. There's no longer the option of parking on an off-ramp or an unauthorized location if a truck parking location is at capacity. So once the driver finds the space uh, to take his or her hours of service and charge and gain hours of service, they have to stay there. Uh, the driver is still going to have to get consecutive rest time. So it may take, let's say it takes three, four hours of charging. They're still going to have to stay there for the rest period. So they're not going to be moving the truck so that someone else can access it. Uh, this ultimately exacerbates the, the truck parking crisis. Uh, there's no way around it. Based on the research, uh, based on the research, it's clear that each of the 313,000 truck parking locations in the U.S. will need a charger. The problem is there's currently not enough parking and putting chargers at all of those locations won't even be enough charging. Ultimately, we will need more parking and more parking that has electricity access, uh, more than the 313. And not to, not to mention the fact that you cannot have a, a commercial enterprise charging, for instance, at a public rest area. We mentioned that in the report and go into those details. Currently, you're not allowed to do that. So that's at least 40,000 truck parking spaces that have a regulatory barrier to getting a, a, a charger at them. Later in the year, as regular readers will be aware, we dug into these and other issues around electric truck technology via an in-depth series that looked for and found, at least in Dreyage out west, real-world implementation of electric trucks, and lessons learned, and barriers experienced. It's really early days on the prohibitively expensive technology. But owner operators remain justifiably wary, given plenty of questions that remain unanswered. Find that series via the equipment section on overdriveonline.com. It kicked off in late October with Alex Lockie's distillation of our readership survey around attitudes around and move to adoption of electric trucks. Okay, number six. It was the final piece of our mid-year Trucking's State of Surveillance series, and the podcast featured my long talk with transportation attorney Hank Seaton about another projected reality, the notion that someday, perhaps sooner than you think, we could be subject to entirely automated roadside inspections, putting enforcement judgment to some degree in the hands of machines. The title of the podcast perhaps said it all, quote, 
FMCSA offering kinder, gentler version of the CSA safety measurement system? Not if automated inspections go live. End quote. Here's how I recapped part of Seton's preceding outline to get to that notion in the conversation. We've got well established, long standing uh, um, problems in the data cube system and the SMS, and we're making these incremental steps to an agency trying to, trying to address some of the issues that we've made. Um, and one thing that stuck out to me in that comment that that, you, that your groups filed um, on the crash preventability, preventability program was the uh, the notion of the, I think it's it's the level eight inspection, uh, CVSA inspection standard. That's an electronic inspection that the uh, Volpe group uh, works with in FMCSA is is uh, which is a technology uh, development group and advice advisor they are in massachusetts and they have been the agency's vendor of choice yeah, okay. for all things uh, all things technology yeah. the uh, uh the algorithms yeah. <laughs> which uh, you know mystified us in 2010 yeah. uh, was a volpe creation and they are the uh, uh the, the data meisters uh, yeah. that the agency relies upon. What came as kind of a shock to us that are trying to puzzle together where the agency is going is that soon after uh, the two uh, proposals we talked about, the kinder, gentler uh, 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 reboot mm-hmm. and uh, broadening the exemptions, <clears throat> right. we, we got the opinion, well, gee, uh, what's it all about? Uh, thanks for making it easier, but if ultimately it's not going to issue safety ratings and you admit that there's not sufficient data, what's it all about? Well, maybe our crystal ball got a little clearer with uh, a notice uh, that, that came out uh, that the FMCSA was going to change its roadside inspection program and that Volpe was working on programs. We haven't seen it. Average of readers who've tuned into our Trucking Status Surveillance series of special reports will no doubt recognize what Seaton's referencing there. And here I explained to him the reporting I'd done about moves towards standing up a test of the Level 8 Automated Electronic Inspection. Essentially a driver inspection that can occur when the truck is simply rolling by a scale or mobile inspection point and communicating electronically with enforcement. The FMCSA's Volpe Center is not necessarily leading the effort toward making that a reality, yet supporting it with FMCSA itself in the lead and the Commercial Vehicle Safety Alliance in a big organizational role itself. After I'd shared what I'd found about the various moves made toward the Level 8 inspection standard, still rather slow going, the Seton and noted that his coalition had referenced Volpe's late May press release, which suggested Level 8 inspections have the potential to collect 10 times more inspection and violation data than is currently found. His first reaction to the sheer complexity of it all was this. Well, I mean, I guess the question is, uh, that little bit of information may, may indicate there's not going to be any new safety fitness determination before my career is over, because, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, to think how slowly we have come in the past 13 years, yeah. the idea of a rolling inspection and uh, yeah. somehow being assured that good inspections were going to be uh, be kept is uh, uh, is, is a sincere issue. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the problems that, uh, uh, that we see, obviously, is... Ten times the amount of data, if if that is true, uh, would take what they have said earlier about uh, uh, accountability under SMS and change it. Yeah. So you know when they say the reason for uh, uh, a kind of uh, gentler inspection system is most of you guys are not going to be measured, to now say well gee. Uh, we're feeding 10 times the data into it. 
uh, 10 times a day. It's just kind of overwhelming to figure out how they would manage it. It's also kind of overwhelming to figure out how how you record all that stuff. With the Search right. Trucking's State of Surveillance at OverdriveOnline.com to find all the parts of that particular package of nine different features covering a variety of technologies impact on the business, trucking's owner-operator, and on over-the-road culture, too. Next, for all the talk of new technology in 2023, the old diesel standard bearer for freight movement was the subject of number five in the podcast countdown, with three experienced operators detailing moves that had brought them to 10 miles per gallon and beyond in collaboration with truck OEMs. Here's one of them, Joel Morrow, detailing the impact of engine downspeeding and other efforts to reduce mechanical drag on fuel economy and their role in the road to 10 plus MPG. Just like we have exponential um, increases in fuel usage when um, we don't have aerodynamics, the same thing happens with mechanical drag in the engine. And, and we, we refer to this as piston speed. We want to slow the piston speed down versus our road speed. So we have less piston strokes per mile traveled. That's less drag. It's better fuel efficiency. What we're also finding out in addition to the fuel efficiency is that that lower piston speed really helps us to hold heat in the combustion process and in the emission system. And a lot of the downsped trucks that I work with and with some of the fleets that I consult with, it has really helped to reduce emission system problems, um, almost to the point where it's almost outweighing the actual fuel efficiency benefit of it. I mean, the fuel efficiency is pretty stellar, but the reduction in maintenance costs to go along with it really makes the new downsped powertrains kind of a no-brainer uh, for overall efficiency. Uh, you know, I've been working with some new gearing in the Volvo iTorque spec that we are looking at having two and even three gears available at highway speeds, meaning we have direct drive, we have, well, we have overdrive, direct drive, and underdrive available um, at speeds from 65 to 85 mile an hour. And this allows us to adapt that engine piston speed to the loads that we're hauling, to the ter terrain that we're driving on. And it, it, it really has an impact on the fuel efficiency. And it, it makes for a better driving experience. You have performance when you need it. Um, when you're pulling hard and power demands high, a little extra RPM doesn't necessarily hurt you uh, because you have that extra heat going on in the system. When you're very light, maybe you've got a 10,000 pound load on and you're, I, I don't know, running across Northern Indiana, um, you know, relatively flat, then we can really lay the RPM down. Um, in the case of the trucks that I'm running, it's sub a thousand. We're running somewhere between 910 and 990 RPM in overdrive at 65 mile an hour in that speed range and uh, getting exceptional fuel efficiency and, and really, really pushing back on the emission system problems that were so common just a few years ago. Another bedrock owner-operator business concern among many featured in Overdrive Radio's number four podcast of the year at a big roundtable with Red Eye Radio's host, Eric Harley, myself, ATBS Vice President Mike Hosted, and our own Gary Books, longtime owner-operator and Overdrive contributor. Conducted at Matt's in March, the roundtable followed on our Partners in Business program seminar there and released the updated 2023 Partners in Business book, Owner Operator Business Start to Finish, effectively that book, and available for download at overdriveonline.com slash PIB. A good bit of the talk focused on freight availability concerns in lean times. For Gary Bucks, as you'll hear, a lot of the strategy he routinely shares with owner operators he works with individually goes right back to business basics. It begins with best practices on customer service. We are in the customer service business. We're not in the driving business. We're not in the driving fast business. We are in it to make a profit, a return for our families. And so when we go into a customer, don't be the problem, be the solution to their problem. Help them recognize that. When they have other truckers there that are causing trouble, when you get a chance to check in, say, look, it looks like you're having a rough day. Let me know how I can help you. That's a, gr that's a great way to start. Right there, a great phrase to use. How can I help you? Here's another thing. 
never, ever mention to a customer, hey, can you hurry up? I got to get to another customer. <laughs> they uh, will slow down on you. They yeah. aren't worried about your next customer. Right. They want you to be worried about them. Right. You never mention your next load. I've had them say, you know, I'd be in the, the waiting room and they'll go grumbling about, you know, waiting and, and the clerk could hear us. And I said, well, I'm not really worried. I'm getting $100 an hour to sit here. The clerk would go like that. 15 minutes later, they'd have me in the door out of there because they didn't want me to get $100 an hour. Right. Now, whether I got 100 or not, they didn't know. Hmm. But I knew how to work the system. Yeah. You know, but I often did get $100 an hour. Being an owner, I negotiated that ahead of time. Mm. that's yeah. the thing yeah. you know all these things factor in you price your whole day on the load you don't just price the mile because you don't know what's going to happen after that you may have to sit the rest of the day you've got to pay for the whole day but we come back to some of those basics of when you're looking for a load building put your name print your name and put your cell phone number on your bills of lady point it out to the customer say Hey, if I pull out of the dock and there's a problem or a question, you call me directly. I've been in the parking lot, had them call and say, we forgot a pallet. Where are you? So well, I'm right outside. Oh, my gosh. It was maybe 30 minutes, but I was getting still getting ready to go. Hmm. If we wouldn't have still been there, if they wouldn't have had my number, they would have had to get an expedite. It would have cost them thousands of dollars to complete that loan. Yeah. I mean, those little things they remember. Number three. 2023 was certainly a rough one on the highways all around the nation, and nowhere was that more literal than along I-40 in Arizona. As owner-operators mid-year called out the absolutely worst stretch of interstate in the country. Getting the conversation around Arizona I-40, getting the conversation started around Arizona I-40 was owner-operator Joey Slaughter out of Danville, Virginia, and pulling a step deck as an independent along a lane for a regular customer that takes him to California and back. Yeah, it hasn't been, I don't, it hasn't been any major repairs in all that time. It, there's even time periods where they'll close lanes of the interstate, not because of road work, but because of it's, it's just almost undrivable. And, uh, you know, that's just not, they don't have a good plan to fix it. You know, I, New Mexico is regularly uh, closing long sections of interstate and working on it. And, and Arizona has got in such a, it's such, it's such, the road is so deteriorated is what I'm trying to say. They can't even uh, close a lane to fix one because everything is bad. I mean, there's no decent road to use anymore in certain sections of 40 especially between flagstaff and kingman and that's a pretty long section of road there right flagstaff yeah it's a, yeah it's about 150 about 150 miles that is the audio recording cut out on us there for unclear reasons gremlins likely and, and it's really nothing that through there it's a couple of small towns and i mean real small and that's the problem is not there's no residents using that road every day it's mostly just trucks going in and out of California. And I'm sure if Arizona has to uh, play favorites, uh, that that's probably one of their least worried about road, least priority is what I'm trying to think of to say, because yeah. it's, it's, but we, we're, we're all taxpayers too, all the people driving these trucks. And so that's why I feel like I have a say in it. And I've tried to voice my concern, uh, I started with Twitter and, and just letting the uh, Arizona DOT Twitter know about it because they're they're pretty interactive with us and and with bad weather and right taking note of road conditions and the person operating the Twitter account uh, uh, took note of it. This was a, a year ago, I think, and okay. told me to voice my concerns on their website, and I did. It was a, it was a uh, it was a page for uh, concerns and uh, opinions to be expressed concerning how to spend the uh, upcoming money for the uh, roads. And, and I, you know, I gave my opinion based as a as a trucker that pays taxes in Arizona. So I figured I, I do have a, a voice that needs to be heard. Sure. But uh, nothing has been done since. Then. 
So we're getting to the end of our run here with hours counting down to just two left with this edition from the summer featuring the latest inductee into Overdrive Radio sponsor Howl's Hall of Fame and owner operator Kate Whiting and her pristine restoration of a 1973 Kenworth A model W900 nicknamed Cherry Pie. Rig that's been turning owner operators heads since we saw it in 2022 at Matt's and profile it in the Custom Rigs video series that year. The podcast focused on Whiting's story. It's one of catching the good old trucking bug as she worked as a health coach to OTR drivers and attended her first truck show, then her second and third, and became fascinated not just with the driving life, but show trucks, truck restoration, and the business itself. Here she is telling part of the story of how she came to get her CDL buy the 1973 KW from a retired owner right there in her own backyard, more or less. I started noticing that I was um, picking out one certain kind of truck that was really my my thing. I was just like, man, I really like that truck. And he'd be like, well, you like, you know, the A's. And I'm, every time I go to another show, I'd be like, oh my gosh, those are just awesome trucks. He's like, you really like A's. The classic A model Kenworth W900 she meets. And so all it took then was like a couple months after uh, South Dakota there, I was just driving uh, a road I go down all the time back home. And lo and behold, you know, it's like, oh, brakes, hit the brakes, hit the brakes. There's one of those trucks. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, it's, you, 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 you know, you don't notice white cars until you see, you know, until you own white car um, yeah. kind of thing. So it was one of those. Where, where that was it? Truck, it was just uh, about 10 miles down the road from my home. Yep, right there in this, uh, right in the driveway in the front yard, had been sitting there. Um, I stopped right then and there and went <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and I, I was like, you know, like taking pictures of it and all this. I didn't worry about if, you know, where the owner was or what the story was. I just had to jump out and take a look at this truck and, and, um, then got to talking to, to Mike and, uh, the owner of the truck and older gentleman. That would and, be former owner, Mike Orton then retired the truck had been parked there for you know quite some time at that point so i definitely had been driving past it but <laughs> it's just again i just never noticed it um really just just fell in love with the truck and decided to um you know talk to him about buying it and get him right. you know thinking about all that and and uh it took about a year to convince yeah. him to to sell the truck but in the meantime then I really had motivation now to get my CDL. Finally, the number one most listened to Overdrive Radio edition of the year featured two separate stories. The first detailed how Landstar leased owner-operator Andy Freeman came to locate a solution to a central problem in his often curfewed heavy and oversized hauling operation. And, Namely, and I've been in platform for 23 years, and a lot of times you just want to take a shower. Uh, just to get those, just to take a rent. With time at a premium, particularly in the short daylight days of the winter months like those we're in now, parking in close proximity to shower facilities isn't always an easy proposition. Freeman, among other things in the podcast, detailed the mostly off-the-shelf option he found from the Evershower company to turn part of his fairly standard-sized 70-inch sleeper into a shower-capable unit. And a lot of times you just want to take a shower. The other part of the podcast, perhaps the reason it garnered so much attention when it did in February of this year, featured our own long haul Paul Marhofer's narrative of his experience out on I-80 in Wyoming during one of the shutdowns of the road with blizzard conditions that were so very frequent earlier in the year. The saga of that road in 2023 was no doubt one of the biggest stories around the time and Marhofer truly brought us all right into the maddening nature of the experience. From exit 6, Evanston, to exit 83, LaBarge Road. As of 6.57 p.m. February 28, 2023. The estimated opening time is unknown. To take us into 2024, finally, here's his rendition of the tale, supplemented by that automated voice, as it were. Happy New Year, everybody. With any luck, the coming months go better across the high plains. As of 6.57 p.m. February 28, 2023, the estimated opening time is unknown. 
Packing to leave on Sunday is the worst. You'd think I'd be used to it by now, after four million miles, but I'm not. In fact, for some reason, it's getting harder. While the folks around us readied themselves for Sunday Mass, I commenced to disgorge the dining room table of an unruly mound of clean laundry, rolling up bib overalls and stuffing them into my red and black Stoops Freightliner duffel bag. A door prize from a 2017 company safety picnic held well before the pandemic sent such events the way of the dinosaur. Then there was the hanging of the shirts, the stowing of socks and undies into their respective compartments. And as I packed, my other half jumper was transfixed upon her phone, watching the weather out west. Have you seen the weather in Wyoming, dear? She said, Oh, and I'm not looking at it. Okay. One of those okays that bore the imprimatur, let's say, of a long suffering trucker's wife. Elongated O followed by a sing songy K. A portent of imminent doom followed by a kind of resignation. Look, I drive the mile that's in front of me. And if they shut me down, they shut me down, I said. That's how I do it. I don't look at the weather. I never look at the weather. I've got food, water, and a blanket. I've got everything I need. What am I going to do? Call off the load? The estimated opening time is unknown. Okay. Then came the loading of food. Shaving kit. Hung shirts, guitar, and that red and black Stoops Freightliner duffel bag into the old F-150. Until the last darkening of the door and the hug goodbye. But this time, Jumper broke down sobbing. She's really not much of a crier, so just what was that all about? Too late. Gotta go. Been 41 years with that woman. And I still really don't know how to read her most of the time. You think I'm afraid of a little snow? Nothing clears the head like a reefer load to Salt Lake City. You go to a small town in Ohio, drop, hook, and there's two and a half days of nothing but pure driving. When it comes to trucking, at least where I work, Salt Lake City, man, it's the best of the best. If the load shakes loose late, or if you simply sandbag it out of the house, all you got to do is get yourself to the Iowa 80 truck stop, declare victory, go to bed, and let the white noise of I-80 sing you to sleep. On better days, you can make Brooklyn, maybe even Stewart, before you shut down for the night. Then there's nothing you have to do but get up the next morning, go about your morning rituals, pre-trip your truck, and drive. It's old man's freight, really. Easy peasy. On the second day, you declare victory at Ogallala, or points west and have yet another nice relaxing sleep get up the next morning go about your pre-trip morning ritual and drive on the third day you deliver yes it's simply the best run they've got except for weeks like this one when you're laid up in a fetal position in laramie with i-80 shut down calling the 511 line over and over again for the automated male voice to tell you, over and over, the estimated opening time is unknown. The estimated opening time is the unknown. Estimated opening time is unknown. The estimated opening time is So you walk into the Petro. There's nothing left to do now but order the hamburger steak and put yourself in a food coma. The ecosystem of a truck stop changes when the road shuts down. People were lingering, having long conversations. I hadn't seen so many customers in there since before the pandemic. I got my belly full, then sauntered into the TV room to see if I could catch a little conversation before nap time. A disheveled man of about thirty was holding forth, telling his troubles to whoever would listen. I've been shut down five times this winter. Last week for four days, he said. It was Tuesday afternoon. There was something wrong with his voice and demeanor, as if all these shutdowns were on the verge of shutting him down. He spoke like a man who 
couldn't quit shivering. I've been here this time since Sunday. He was probably some mega fleet rookie psyched out by a hand holding dispatcher, I thought. That's what you tell yourself when you've got a job to do and people around you are melting down. I had to get out of that room. The food coma was beginning to make itself known just as a desperation was coming over me. I walked outside. I thought of my wife asking if I'd looked at the weather. Maybe I should have given it a look-see. At least in Ogallala, I called her and told her as much, then went to sleep. I came out of the food coma around dusk. The wind was still howling. The automated male voice broke the bad news. The estimated opening time is unknown. 8 p.m. Same. The estimated opening time is Around unknown. 9, I slammed a quart of whole milk and some Oreos and induced my second coma. I was slept out by one and called one more time. We were open. This was different than previous road closure situations I'd been in in years past. In pre-ELD days, you could tell the road was open by a mass exodus of trucks. It was like people leaving a concert. Now just two or three were trickling out. Somehow, I relished the change, though. Surprisingly, few rigs were on the road now, and almost all of them were driving like real pros. The hardest thing in recent months has been the sheer volume of trucks going insanely fast in icy conditions. I've seen it. You're barely holding it together at 35 or 40 miles per hour, and they scorch past you doing 60, maybe 70 in the lane that hasn't even been cleared of snow. And they all look so young to me. California, Illinois, from wherever they're from. Maybe it's my own perception bias, I'll admit. But you just know they're going to wreck. Sometimes they do. Many times you see those same trucks jackknifed in the median. At least for now, those guys weren't on this road. As if a higher force was out there somewhere saying, No worries, Hand. I got this. It's been a winter from hell here. The Wyoming Business Report noticed fatalities went up from 6 in 2022 to 20 in 2023 as of February 17th, a spike north of 300%. After some time, conditions cleared, and we were at road speed westbound and heading for Elk Mountain. Maybe next time I'll catch the weather ahead of time and go the southern route through Denver. Thanks for listening. This is Paul Marhofer. Have a safe trip. Big thanks, Paul. Overdrive Radio is a production of Overdrive, the voice of the American trumpet. It's edited and produced by me, Todd Dills, with the acoustic guitar and other support of trucker songwriter Long Haul Paul Marhofer. The theme is Legend of the Snake Man by Marhofer, featuring the guitar work of Travis the Snake Man himself, Lemmick. Terry Tupsox Richardson on bass, keys by Tishomingo Jim Whitehead, and drums Andrew Marshall. The podcast is backed up further by Overdrive's own news editor Matt Cole, executive editor Alex Lockie, and video editors Lawson Rudisil and Andrew Gwynn. 